Right. No, just wait. We have plans. Say, we have plans. God has plans for you and I. And I'm telling you, it includes what? Anybody know what the plans of God is for us? You know what it says? For our good. Say our good. How can, if mercy, how can God not be good, but he has good thoughts and good plans for us? It's amazing. All right. Well, listen, next week we're going to start on something. We're, we're continuing on our work in relationship with the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, I'm telling you, I'm so excited about this because there's just something new, an element of the Lord every, every day that I find, especially about the Holy Spirit as we're just tapping into this amazing fount of God. But one of the things, I'm going to take the river and we'll study about not only just it, more of what we talked about just a little while ago, but how important this river is that flows out of Eden. And there is a lot of scuttle around. There, there's theologians that just get into it. And I happen to be won by scriptural evidence when you look at the preponderance of scripture that think that the Garden of Eden was probably Jerusalem. And man has done its attempt to build over. But you know, there is a new Eden coming. The old Eden's not gonna be found. The Bible says there is a new Eden, a new Jerusalem that's going to descend. But when we look at the evidence, you're going to see something interesting. And uh, there is rivers mentioned in that that flows out of Eden. And I believe it's a prophetic message to you and I today. And so I really want you to be looking forward to this and bring somebody that comes, especially someone who doesn't understand what God's doing right now. They, They may have no clue. Bring them. Because I'll tell you, there'll be a lot of clarity when we leave here. But, say but, before we get to that, there's some things that the Holy Spirit wants to settle with you and I today. And it's about power, love, and self-control. It's about power, love, and a sound mind. So if you would go ahead, let's put our first scripture up for me, Stephen. For God will never, say never. Never. Now listen, I'm just going to go ahead. We're going to slap the evil one right upside the head right now. You ready? We might as well just get it out of the way. He is a punk liar. He was a punk liar then in the garden. He's a punk liar today, and he'll be a punk liar tomorrow because he will never change. The Bible says in John 8, 44, that Satan is a liar and a murderer, and there is no truth in him. So I am getting, it gets a little rough when the saints... By the way, who'd that be? That'd be us. We'd be the saints. Um, When we constantly hear the enemy's voice and somehow he gets it to believe, us to believe it's our voice coming from God. See, that's his plan. He wants that message to be changed. You know, he comes at Eve and he says, well, if God, well, he knows, he knows better. And you know, he, he proof text some scripture. He didn't quote scripture correctly. He didn't, guys, he's even talking to Jesus in the wilderness and he doesn't quote scripture correctly. We got to be careful about listening to partial word today. I'm telling you, the enemy has the same MO. It's a modi operandi of the enemy. He has the same MO. He's a liar from the beginning. He's a liar today. He'll lie tomorrow. So if you're hearing guilt and shame and condemnation, beloved, that is a lie from the devil. And I don't understand why we, the church, buy into it. The counselors are filled, the psychiatrists are filled with church folk. And I don't get it. We have the mind of Christ. Jesus isn't sick. Jesus' thoughts aren't of, you know, listen, I'm not knocking. I'm telling you, we all need a little come alongside. We need some help. But my point is, you can't rely upon people to do what only God can do in our life. You just can't do it. Well, we can, but that's called codependency. We are not codependent on Jesus. The church has become steadily codependent on politics, religion, Drugs, alcohol, sex, we're on code. We are not, we are interdependent of one another. We are dependent upon God. Say dependent upon God. Interdependent with each other. You know what that means? 
we're connected. We're one another. With, we, we build one another. We need one another. I need you. You need me. I don't care what kind of flaws I have, and I don't care what flaws you got. We need those flaws. We need one another. In fact, one of the things that's really interesting is I love reading labels. You ever just gone to the grocery store, the drugstore over there? Maybe that might not be a bad word, but the pharmacia store. You, you, go to, uh, you, you go to Walgreens or CVS. That's a free plug for them. You go to those things, and if you'll look at stuff, just pick up vitamins or things they sell or deodorant or anything and read the labels. Have you ever done it? You owe it to yourself because about 60 to 70% of all the stuff that's in there is inactive ingredients. If it's inactive, what I want with it? But you're paying and I'm paying for those inactive ingredients. I mean, if the active ingredients, we might get out of there for about two bucks less on something. But we got to pay for all this stuff that's not working. Beloved, that is the enemy's game plan for you and I today, to pay for stuff that ain't working. It's inactive. It doesn't do anything for us. But yet, great example. Flex Seal. Who's familiar with Flex Seal? Now, I'm going to tell you what, WD-40 and Flex Seal, man can go to the moon. I'm just telling you straight up. Drop me off naked with a pocket knife and WD-40, some duct tape, and Flex Seal, I will build Las Vegas. You hear what I'm saying? I'm just telling you. That Flex Seal, I had this leak. I called Robert when he was over there with uh, Pastor Jason's company, Jason, uh, Phillips Painting and Guttering, and I'm up there, and I'm going... I'm cranking that flex seal, and I'm telling you, it'll stop it, but it looks nasty. But, but the point I'm trying to say with all this, it's just a substitute for the real thing. It's not fixing anything. You're masking it. And I'm telling you, beloved, today is the day that God wants us to get back to the pure heart and love of the Word of God and let's not mix the word with anything else. Let's not quit saying that Jesus is not enough in my health. Let's, say, let's quit saying that Jesus is not enough in my marriage and my finances in the church. Jesus, Jesus is more than enough. He's more than enough. So here's what happens. The enemy comes and tells us that, you know, it just, it, well, Galatians, you remember the Galatians, Paul writes, my dear idiots, my foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Well, the Judaizers and the Gnostics and the Antinomalists. Antinomalists are this. Antinomalists were people of that day that believe that once you come to Jesus, you are no longer flesh and blood, but you are spirit. Say spirit. spirit. Now, they're not wrong, but they're not right in their understanding of it. Yes, we are spirit men and women, but... We are also held accountable for what we do in that spirit in our flesh. Here's what I mean. The antinomalists believe that because you're spirit, you can do anything that you want to do, justify anything you want to do, and have no repercussions, no condemnation, no, no law against it because you are spirit. It's not your, it, that's your flesh, and the flesh is gone. Now, we laugh at that today, but that's exactly what we're seeing in the body of Christ. We're seeing folks take liberty with the word of God and with the blood of Jesus because, well, God loves me, therefore I can do anything I want to do. Well, that's true, but God will love us even going to hell. Does that make sense? The other one, Galatians, was Galatianism, and Galatianism plainly states, the Judaizers come in, they say, well, this Jesus, he's a great guy, he's a prophet, and you know what, we'll, we'll say that he's Lord, we'll say he's Messiah, but he's not enough. See, his righteousness, yeah, he's righteous, but his righteousness is not enough. We must add our righteousness to it. Now, that's exactly what Adam did in the garden, when he sowed the fig leaf, he told God how his righteousness was going to be from that point in time on. And if you want to accept me, you now accept my righteousness. Does that make sense? Well, that worked. 
God drove him out of there with a flaming, you know, flaming angel of swords. And that was mercy to Adam because if Adam would have stayed in Eden in his fallen state, there would have been no redemption for you and I. See, God even then provided the way, the truth, and the life for you and I. It was an amazing thing. And the last one that comes out of this thing is just pure legalism. And we're seeing it today. Legalism. Legalism abounds. Legalism. It's man's attempt to, to take doctrine and make it one's own, just like the Pharisees did in the temple when they were, Jesus comes and says, you've made my father's house a house of thieves, a, a, a den of robbers. You, this is a house of prayer, and you, you've made it a place where you sell and buy. And, and you know, it must have hurt Jesus to come in, and when he saw the money changers and the doves. being So, you know, Jesus was not raised, even though he is the richest of all, he is all money. He owns everything. He is the richest one ever. And I'm telling you, but yet he lived a life of a carpenter's son. And he lived very meager. And you realize that the only offering that Joseph and Mary could have done back in those days were doves. See, doves were set aside by God for those that didn't have and that was what God would receive from those that, like the widow that, that gave the, the copper mite, the, the, the one thing. And it was all probably that pure widow had. And she gave it. And Jesus said, I've never seen such faith in all of Israel. Here's guys giving all kinds of money. But she gave, he said, because she gave out of her need, gave out of her poverty. Well, that's a thought, beloved. And so the point I'm trying to make is the enemy knows that we know this stuff, but he tries to throw stuff at us. And here's what he wants to use in these days. It's called fear and cowardice. Fear and cowardice. Why? Because God said, listen, why do you think the devil loves to accuse you and I, even now, night and day before the throne? Why do you think? He doesn't have a leg up on he, he he has he doesn't have our dossier anymore. It's been destroyed. Hey, our sins are remembered no more. He can't bring that up. You know what he does? He's up there accusing God before the throne, not in day, not necessarily you and I. And let me tell you what he's saying. He's gonna go up there and he says, You know what? Dave did something wrong this week. He sinned. Your word says the wages of sin is what? Death. Kill him. God, you said your promise, you said the wages of sin is death. He sinned, kill him. That's what he's up there doing. And Jesus steps up and he said, but see, I nailed that to the tree. He said, I took that to the grave. I took Dave with me. Dave's been raised anew. Dave is no longer of this world. He's not of your world. Therefore, I remember his stuff no more. He is squeaky clean. And God, and he said, besides that, not only did I nail it to the law, but he said, I'm going to tell you, I stripped you of all of those weapons. Beloved, we got to quit believing some of this stuff that's coming down. God did not give us a spirit. Look what it says. Spirit, love, and self Let's look at the scripture. For God will never give you the spirit of fear or timidity. Fear and timidity is the same Greek word, and both of them have to deal with cowardice. God will take, Satan knows this, God will take no pleasure in those who what? Back up, going, oh my God, Satan, he's so big. He's so, cancer, so big. Sickness is so big. Oh my gosh, poverty is so big. And we shrink back and we start believing the lie of the devil because he's a liar and a murderer. But Jesus said, I've come to give life and I've come to give abundant life. What does abundant life mean? Abundant life. What is abundance? Listen, let me just give you a, a great little uh, uh, biological understanding here. Coke and water are not the same thing. They're both thirst quenchers. Are they? The sodium in Coke causes the brain, the hypothalamus, to say, I need more. So you drink more than enough, 
and the body lives off the energy that that fuel, uh, fuel produces, not what it is. And what happens is, so then it begins to tell the hypothalamus, I need more Coke to quench my thirst. I defy anybody in this room to get two liters of Coke and two liters of, let's just say for the sake of argument, distilled water. I defy anyone to kill. I promise you, you could drink two liters of Coke in a matter of no time. But I dare you try to guzzle two liters of distilled water. Your brain will go, stop, stop. I've had enough. Why? Because there is something that God created us in truth. It's called a satiety center. It knows when we've had enough truth, but it doesn't know when we've had enough lie. The flesh is never satisfied. It doesn't know. It doesn't register. That's why the brain tries to prove everything true. Why? Because there's satisfaction in the truth. I mean, the great Christian rock band, you know, uh, you know uh, I can't get no satisfaction. The flesh is never satisfied. You can't feed it enough. You can't drink enough. It can't do enough. It wants more. It wants more. And yet, Jesus said, let me fill you with me. Let me fill you with my spirit. That's why it's important to be filled with the Holy Ghost every morning. The Holy Spirit, get up and just say, Father, fill me. Fill me to overflow. Why? Because it's the overflow that's going to mess people up. It's not what's inside of us that's going to mess them up. It's what comes out of us is what messes up. I want us to be all, you remember the old whammo slip and slides? My brother would hide pieces of rock and concrete underneath my, so he, he was just the way he was. Eight years, I used to press on my head, so I'm like that for a reason. That's what the devil wants to do. He thinks, he thinks he's the older brother. He thinks he's the firstborn of creation. I got news. Jesus is the firstborn. Oh, beloved, Listen. God will never, say never. never. He ain't kidding. I will never do this to you. So if you get fear, listen, there's a healthy fear. It's called reverence. It's called awe. I'm telling you, Jesus walks through this room. Man, we ain't going to be running up going, dude, how are you doing? I'm telling you, we will flatten out right there and we'll be crying and we'll be screaming praises unto him. We'll be copping out stuff and he'll, he'll lift us up. And he'll say, hey, 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 I love you, my son. I love you, my daughter. That's the Jesus we know. But I'm telling you, there's, there's, there's a lack of awe and reverence for the Lord today. Uh, profanity, it's not just cussing. You can't, you, you know, there's groups that oh, you, you, you say poo-poo and you're going to hell. That, that's not how it works. God's, big, God's bigger than poo-poo. I mean, come on. He's bigger than that. When we profane and speak profanity, profane means to make common. When you and I make Jesus Christ common, we have profaned the name of the Lord. That's where the Holy Spirit comes in and goes, man, you're killing me here. You're quenching me and you're grieving me and you're insulting me. You're mocking me. You can't do this stuff. And so how this thing starts, but... I love those but scriptures. But the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power. Now, wait a minute. Let's look at this. God will never give you a spirit of fear, but the Holy Spirit who gives you mighty power, love, and self-control. Say power. power. Love. love. Self-control. Self now, let's touch our, touch our soul. Say power. power. Love. Love self-control. Let's touch your hearts. Power, love, self-control. You know that if the soul comes into alignment with the spirit man that we have, and our spirit man lives power, love, and self-control, the soul will come into alignment with the spirit. That means our mind, will, and emotions will believe power, love, and self-control. And then I'm telling you, your bodies and my body will have to believe power, love, and self-control because the body reacts to the spirit not and, and the soul. And if the soul is unhealthy, our bodies will be unhealthy. 
be in good health as our body prospers, as our bank accounts grow. No, be in good health is what? Our soul, mind, will, and emotions prosper. When my soul, mind, will, and emotions are on this power, love, and self-control, my body is in perfect alignment to the spirit of the living God. And I'm telling you, right blessed are those that seated at the right hand of God. And by the way, that be us. He's looking right at us today and he's saying, beloved, welcome. I want you to know I've prepared something for you before the very foundation of the world that you would be blessed and you would have joy. And on top of that, you would have more joy. You, it is unquenchable joy. I'm, oh, beloved, so much psychosis in the body of Christ today. So much phobia. And it's because we just will not relinquish our spirit into the body. We're trying to be soul-led instead of spirit-led. Now, look what happens. Let's put up the first, first scripture where we talk about power. Let's put that up. Here's power. Let's look at some scriptures. I always love to give you scriptures. Amen? Yes. Ephesians three sixteen. And I pray that, the, that he would unveil within you the unlimited riches. Say unlimited riches. Unlimited riches. By the way, you know there's treasure inside of us. I'm telling you, listen, Satan's a treasure hunter. He comes to kill, steal, and destroy. He wants what you got. Make no, make no mistake. Why? Because God took it from him, and he gave it to you. He's ticked. He's hateful. He's mean. He don't, he don't want it. He just don't want you to have it. That's his M.O. Now, look at this. Unlimited riches of his glory and favor until super. No, you got, are you seeing this? We're to hold on with the riches of his glory and favor until supernatural floods your innermost being with his divine might and explosive power. See, we got to hang on in our thinking. See, the Bible says we can't choose our thoughts, but it does say think on these things. Philippians 4, 8, whatever is lovely, pure, good, these things. When we're thinking the mind of Christ, I'm telling you, it's a matter of a short time to where our bodies and our innermost being begin to explode with supernatural power. Now, let me know, tell you something about supernatural people. They do supernatural things. It's impossible for a supernatural being to just do mere natural things. And it's impossible for someone in the natural to do supernatural things. Beloved, you got to settle that today. Either you're a natural man and woman, you're just mere men and women, or are we supernatural resurrected people? If we are, act like it. It's that simple. Oh, pastor, but you don't know. I don't care to know. Act like it. In fact, nature said, I'm groaning. I'm groaning for the sons of God to stand up and act like sons of God. Come on, people. Well, I'm going to be in the strangling ministry starting next week. You come to me, well, you just don't know. I, I'm just going to tell I'll be, I'll strangle you. Maybe I can get, Jesus, Jesus, maybe I can get that out of him. That'd be good. But here we go. I pray. Now, look at this. Wait, wait, wait. Go back, go back, go back. With his divine might. And he said, it's not by our strength. It's not my power. It's not my righteousness. It's not my holiness. It's his, saith the Lord. We just got to tap in and let him do it. Listen, we got a spring, you know, we got a water fountain out here. You, you realize that I don't know why you have water fountain in the church. Ain't nobody going to drink out of it. We've been told that I drank out of a hose back in the day. You remember that? You remember you, you crank the hose up. I mean, there's all kinds of green stuff around the rim of the hole. We, don't, we didn't die. If we did, it'd be a real miracle today, you know? But I'm just saying, warm hose water. Oh, come on. Who's, drank, who's never drank out of a hose today? Slip your hand up. You're telling me that everybody in this room has drank out of a hose? You've drank out of a hose? I love y'all. Y'all are amazing. Did you die? Did you have to go to the emergency room? I know you act a little weird, but that's okay. All right. Here we go. 
Next verse. Let's look at Ephesians 20, 20, 20, 20, 3, 20 and 3, 21. Never doubt God's... Hey, what does that mean? What does never doubt mean? Oh, God. What? what are, oh, never doubt. Never doubt. God's mighty power to work in you and accomplish all this. He will achieve infinitely more than your greatest request. See, guys, we know in part, we can't even ask the right question. That's why the Holy Spirit has to intercede with you and I in groanings and utterance, because sometimes we just can't ask the right question. We just can't say enough to God, because we know in part. I know 100% of 50%. What does that mean? I know 50%. Do you think I could trust the guy that knows the other 50%? Here we go. Infinitely more than your greatest request, your most unbelievable dream, and exceed your wildest imagination. He will outdo them all for his miraculously, his miraculous power constantly energizes us. Listen, beloved, if you don't get anything else for the rest of your days, get this. It's no longer we who live, but Christ in us. And Christ is the miraculous. Christ is miracle. Christ is the source of power and strength. It's not we who live, it's Christ. in That means it's not our faith that is going to take it to the next level. It's the faith of Jesus in us that's going to take it to the next level. It's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of Jesus that's going to take us. On and on and on. Who are we? We are hosts. Everybody in this room is possessed. Do we understand that? Come on. Some even need to be repossessed. What do you mean, Pastor? You say, no, I'm not talking about demonically controlled. I'm talking about filled, controlled by the Holy Spirit. I am possessed by the Spirit of God. That means I'm going to shoot guacamole, speak Latin, and, 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 and turn my head around. Yeah, I'll be foolish for Christ if that's what he needs. Now, look at this. So, what's the next one? We have power, love. Say love. Let's look at love. Woo! Love. Love. Romans 5, 5. And this hope is not, does it, boy, I love hope. Hope is the same word for expectation. We get exactly what we hope for or what we expect to get. And again, you've heard me get on this before. I'll keep doing it. Take hope so out of your vocabulary. Hope so is doubt and unbelief. Well, God will show up, take care of that signet. Well, I hope so. That's unbelief. That is unbelief, and that simply means you're only going to be doing part of God's word and receiving part of God's word. And I'm telling you right, you're a coach, right? Let me tell you something. Your players, if they gave you half of what they got, do they start? No, sir, they don't. What makes you think that God will make us start if we're only giving him half? We'll sit on the bench. And you know what's sad? There are folk that's content to be on the bench because they'll get a letter no matter what. But that's not how we were raised. I tell you, the coaches in Dallas, they voted when we got a letter. You had to do certain things, and the coaches got together. All of the 36 coaches in Dallas got together and voted on who got letters in the other school. Isn't that the coolest thing? I'm telling you, we got a letter. We wore it. It'd be 112 degrees outside. We're wearing our letter jackets because it meant something to us. But, beloved, you and I are stained with the blood of Jesus. When we go outside, everybody's seeing you wearing a letter jacket. You've made varsity. Jesus, the coach, has set you on the field. You've lettered. Look at this. And this hope is not disappointing fantasy because we can now experience the endless love of God. Hey, my endless love. Isn't that a song? Wow. Who's that, Lionel Richie? Boy, that boy's smooth. You know? I'm just going to throw it. Lionel Richie. You can't be in a bad mood and listen to Lionel Richie. You can't do it. I'm telling you, man, mess you up. Here we go. Because we can now experience the endless love of God, cas- oh, cascading. What does that mean? Overflowing, cascading. Overflowing. If you have a commode, it's cascading. <laughs> cascaded into our hearts through the Holy Spirit 
who lives in us. So it's not only us, it's not only Jesus who lives in us, it's the Holy Spirit that lives in us. Well, wait a minute. The Spirit of Jesus, Jesus and the Holy Spirit can't go anywhere without God the Father, so guess what? It's no longer we who live, but all them in us. We got the fullness. Come on, say fullness. All right, let's look at the next verses. Here we go. Oh, I'm actually going to read eight verses. Hang in there. Don't get bored. No potty breaks during this. It's important. And he has given us his spirit. Oh, oh my gosh. Within us so that we can have the assurance that he lives in us and that we live in him. I mean, come on. Look at this. Moreover, we have seen with our own eyes. That's an eyewitness. We talked about in our Wednesday night class what it is to be an eyewitness. What gives credible testimony? I'm an eyewitness. I didn't hear say. I didn't hear about it. I've seen it. Turn around and look at each other real quick. You are now eyewitnesses to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Because everybody in this room was dead in their sin before. And now you're alive in Christ Jesus. So you can walk out of here and under oath in a court of law said, I have seen Jesus today because if I've seen these, I've seen him. Come on. Oh, Pastor, that's a technicality. Yeah. Moreover, we have seen with our own eyes and can testify to the truth that Father God has sent his son to be savior of the world. Those who give thanks that Jesus is the son of God, oh my gosh, there it is. When I tell you thankfulness is the greatest way, the quickest way to get in the presence of God, not only is that, if you cannot give thanks, you're not in the son of God. Oh, Pastor, you can't say that. I'm a happy man. I got a, There's a lot of happy people ready for happy hour right now. And God's not in them. I'm telling you straight up, look what it says. Those who give thanks that Jesus is the Son of God live in God. If for we, one reason we can't give thanks, how are we going to do that? Look what it says. We have come into an intimate experience with God's love. And we trust in the love he has for us. God is love. Those who are living in love are living in God. That's how the Jews came to know Jesus back in the days because they saw the love that the Jews, the, those in Christ Jesus had for one another and they wanted it because the rules and regulations left them empty. Let's keep going. And God lives through them. By living in God, love has brought to us it, it's, it, uh, to its full expression in us so that we may fearlessly face the day of judgment. God's not giving us a spirit of timidity or, or, or uh, of, 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 of cowardice, but power, love, and a sound mind. That's what it's saying. Look, I can go to judgment today fearless because there is therefore now no condemnation in Randy Speed. And there's no condemnation in you. The enemy wants to tell it it is, but he's a liar. Look at this. Jesus now is, so are we in this world. Love never brings fear, for fear is always related to punishment. Isn't that something? Here we go. Keep going. But love's perfection drives the fear of punishment far from our hearts. Whoever walks constantly afraid of punishment has not reached love's perfection. Oh, beloved, if you're worrying about what God's going to do to you or what, he, he, listen, oh, come on, settle that today. That's not the God we serve. We serve a God that loves us so much. He gave his only begotten son who loves us that much before the very foundation of the world, the lamb as if slain for you and I, that we could sit here today and be loved by God. It's an amazing thing. Our love for others is our grateful response to the love God first demonstrated to us. Anyone can say, I love God. Say anyone. anyone. But look at this. Yet have hatred toward one another or another believer. This makes him a phony. <laughs> because if you don't love a brother or sister whom you can see, how can you truly love God whom you can't see? Look at this. For he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also demonstrate love to others. Isn't that amazing? So we have power, love, and let's look at self-control. Here we go. Galatians 5.16. 
as you yield freely and fully to the dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit. See, there's the key. Are you and I willing to yield our life fully? Say fully. Not half, not three quarters, but fully. Are you and I ready to yield fully, fully to the life and dynamic life and power of the Holy Spirit? You will abandon the cravings of self-life. Self-control won't be an issue, beloved. You won't have to worry about when you go to sleep at night what you did the day or night before. You wake up the next morning, you don't have to worry about what you did the night before. Did it glorify God? Did it, did it hurt somebody? Did it, did it glorify myself? You, you, those, those questions are answered in a relationship with Jesus. I was a drunk when I met Carol. I drank excessively. I fought constantly. Carol can tell you, I don't know, except for Jesus in her, she stayed with me for the first three years of our marriage. I got tired of putting in new walls in a room because I would put my head or a fist through them. I got tired of fighting. I got tired of breaking stuff. I got tired of getting drunk, waking up in streets and places. I don't know how I got there. That was my life. And I was content, but I saw something in her. I saw something in Carol. There was a power in Carol that wouldn't break. And I tell you, I did my best to see it happen. And it didn't break. And she, through her, gave me that opportunity to meet. As, as she leads my dad to the Lord, my dad was my closest friend at the time. And my dad asked me to go see his pastor. And then you know the story. And Bob Ross, who comes here from time to time, led, led me to Jesus. And that night, I felt something come off of my body, came off of me like an anvil. I told Carol, it's like for the first time I felt upright. I could feel something come off my spine. And I tell you, I went home, drank a beer. I had a case of Budweiser and a fifth of wild turkey. That would last me for two days. Drank a beer and puked right there on the spot. That was it. That was it. And I got to thinking, if my God would do something that I didn't ask him to do, how much more would he do what I asked him to do in his son's name? And I'm telling you, here it is. The result of that is this. And it's been a learning process. I struggled with the Holy Spirit. I struggled with Scripture. I, I, I held the Scripture more important than Jesus. And I'm telling you, of all people, Thomas Kincaid messed me up. He talked to me. He said, quit settling, settling for a replica or a painting. Go after the author. Go after the painter. And so, uh, well, let's show you this next verse. Let's look at this. Titus. Well, we don't quote Titus. Titus is a cool name. Listen, if you're pregnant, you want to have a kid, name him Titus. That'd be awesome. <laughs> Titus. Don't sound like a wuss, does it? Here's Titus. The same grace teaches us how to live each day as we turn our backs on ungodliness and indulgent lifestyles, and it equips us to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. Beloved, if there's ever a time for the church to live upright, godly lives, this is it. We're about to register for those who's never registered to vote. I'm telling you, you better vote. Don't be surprised one day, beloved. You better vote. Now, I know what Scripture says. God puts leaders in places. But I'm going to tell you something. This is one of those that the Lord builds his house. It's labor's labor in vain. We're going to co-labor with Jesus. You register to vote, and you vote your heart, and you vote your conscience. I'm not telling you who or what to vote for. I'm telling you, I think there's corruption on both sides but not Jesus. And I'll say this. Jesus himself said, you beware of the leaven of the Pharisee and the leaven of Herod. Do you know what that means? Leaven represents sin and that which works behind the scenes to cause a a It was a catalyst. And you be careful right now because I want to tell you, the only time in human history where the religious and the political came together 
was to kill Jesus Christ. And we're seeing it happen right now before our very eyes. But we, it says if we humble ourselves before the Lord and we seek his face and we pray, it says then he'll hear from heaven and he'll do what? He'll heal our land. Come on. So you go, if you haven't registered to vote, you go vote. If you're not planning on voting, you vote. Come on now. We all have friends that laid their lives down for you and I to be able to vote. Okay, that was free. Look at this. He equips us to live. Now, look at this. Let's go. All right, I want to close with this one. Let's go back to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit, by the way, are we known by our fruit? Our fruits. Fruits. The fruit of the Holy Spirit. There may be nine things, but it's only one fruit. But we're known by the overflow of that fruit. And it can manifest in a number of different ways. But here it is. But the fruit produced by the Holy Spirit within you is divine love in all its varied expression. If you don't have a little joy overflow problem today, just go to the Holy Spirit. Father, I need your strength today. Holy Spirit, come. Give me the the joy of the Lord is my strength. I need some joy. I need some joy. Look at this. Joy that overflows. Peace that subdues. See, we think of peace as that peace we just back away. Peace is not the absence of conflict. It's knowing that we got that sucker whooped in the midst of battle. It's peace that subdues. It's my peace that subdues the enemy. Come on. Peace that subdues. Patience that endures. God knows if we need some patience. I, w- I was talking to Rick. By the way, that, that service for Rick was just a hoot. Lynn, I, I just got to tell you, it, it was on my mind this morning. Seeing Doug, his brother, smile. It's like watching Rick. He just cracked. He's just a smaller version of Rick. It just cracked me up. But we were talking about this, this patience that endures. There's a lot of thin-skinned Christians today. There's thin-skinned America today. You what? Well, you can't do that. I'm, I'm going to sue. I'm offended. I'm, I'm, I'm offended at this and that. If you wear some kind of animal, all the animal rights go bonkers. If you, good Lord. But you know what happens? It's a natural process of death and aging for people to be thin-skinned. Let me show you why. How many of you are over... 60 here today. Okay, well, I'm not embarrassing everybody. Hey, aren't we glad? Better you notice back in the day, I could be hit with a bullet, a tank, machine gun, machete, or whatever, and I might just get a little bit of a, a little bit of a, a, a little redness. Somebody can slam a door in Denton, and I get a bruise on my arm. You know what I'm talking Hey, you know what I'm talking about? It's those blood, come on. Why? Because the skin gets old and crepey. But there is OJ beauty products for such things. I, hey, I like OJ. I mean, it's good stuff. You know? We need some patience as we're growing older and getting thin skinned. We need some patience. Look at this. Kindness in action. What good is kindness if we're not acting kind and being kind? Well, I'm a very kind-hearted person. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you get run over? Okay, well, I'm, I'm very kind. You know the story. Didn't those folks do that in the parable where the guy was robbed and beaten laying in the street and the priests and, and all the other people came, but the good Samaritan. And, and we thank the good Samaritan's church. No, the Holy Spirit was the good. Jesus is the good Samaritan. The church, the, the end that he was placed in was the Holy Spirit. And the ones that the Holy Spirit told the, now you make sure this guy is fed and clothed the whole time he stay and I'll take care of it. That's the church. Here it is. Is that it? A life full of virtue, faith that prevails, gentleness of heart and strength of spirit. Never set the law above these qualities, for they are meant to be limitless. Say, I have unlimited 
access to the very throne of my Father God in Jesus Christ. You know what? What phone plan you have? And they say it's unlimited. Read the fine print. You get unlimited service and best coverage here, by the way, and you only get it for $9.99. Read the fine print. Read the Bible and find that you have unlimited access. You have unlimited power. You have unlimited love. Amen? Let's touch our hearts. Father, all over this room, we thank you. We seal in our heart your word today, Father, your scriptures, your scriptures that are truthful, your scriptures that are inerrant, not, that, Father, they are for you and I today. They, they are from your mouth to our ears and to our hearts. And from our heart, our mouth will speak. And Father, I would ask that we would become insatiable with meditating on your word day and night. That when we understand it and we begin to walk in your word, Father, our bodies, our soul, our mind, our finances, our, our diseases, our way of life has to come into alignment to the shed blood of Jesus Christ and the resurrection of power and glory in our life. And we thank you, Father, that what you have begun in our life, you say, Father, you will complete in us. Just like Jesus said, it's been completed in him. And we say thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Woo, baby. Awesome.